Song goes round and reaches Australia as the most popular of all tenors lands at Melbourne to start on a concert tour for the Australian Broadcasting Commission. Mrs. Tarber, who is also the screen beauty Diana Napier, accompanies her husband. Mr. Charles Moses, ABC chief, greets them in the studio. I'm happy to be able to introduce to you Mr. Richard Tarber, whose voice is already so well known to you through his films and his records. Mr. Tarber's visit is an epic occasion in the musical history of this country. At last, I can say hello to you in your own country. Since long time I wanted to come to Australia, at last I am here. Even if I am here only two days, I know I will enjoy myself very much. And I hope you will enjoy my singing just the same. And what do you think of the Australian girls, Mrs. Tarver? Much too attractive. That's why I didn't let my husband come by himself. <laughs> I suppose you've already heard something of Australia from your accompanist, Mr. Percy Carr. He was here before, wasn't he? Oh, yes. He was here already twice. But I heard a lot of your wonderful country from uh, Lotte Lehman. Oh. An, an old friend of mine. We just sang together in the common garden season in London a few weeks ago. But now we are in Australia. And I want my dinner. So, my Richard Tauber captured a very special place in the international world of music during the 1930s and 40s. The great German conductor Bruno Walter said of him, whatever he sang was ennobled by his sense of beauty. In this next hour, we're going to look at the career of Richard Tauber, and especially at his highly successful tour of Australia, which began in June 1938, 40 years ago. We'll be hearing from his widow, Diana Napier, and also from Nancy Brown, his leading lady in London during the war years. As far back as 1934, Richard Tauber had received offers to tour Australia, but he had refused them because of the long distance. It was only after he discovered that a piano could accompany him on the long sea voyage that a contract for a three-month tour of Australia was signed with the ABC. Incidentally, that piano had to be screwed to the floor of the cabin to make it stable. Richard and his beautiful wife, Diana Napier, first flew to Rome and later sailed from Naples on the Orient liner, Orontes. He gave a concert in Colombo and received a tremendous reception there. The ship reached Melbourne at the end of June 1938, and the Taubers and their entourage were immediately given a welcoming lunch by the ABC, where, to quote a newspaper report, the wit flowed with the wine. Richard made an impromptu speech. His opening words were, I have very little English, but I hope that I get everything right. From the very start of the tour, Mrs. Tauber, Diana Napier, attracted great interest with her elaborate wardrobe and sparkling personality. One newspaper called her a gay and radiant creature, witty and with a sense for beauty and chic clothes. Another reporter found her a charming picture. Richard's first Australian concert was held at the Melbourne Town Hall on Thursday, June the 30th, 1938. He opened with a group of four Schubert leader, which made delightful hearing. After a violin sonata, played by the associate artist Vaughan Hanley, Richard then sang three Grieg songs, Last Spring... In the boat, and this one, Ein Traum. Mir träumt einst ein schöner Traum. Mich liebte eine blonde Maid. Es war am grünen Waldesraum. Es war zu der warmen Frühlingszeit. Der Sprang der Waldbach schon wohl, der Nost im Dorf verschollen geweiht. Wir 
Received, but Tarba captivated the audience that night by his singing of popular ballads. Despite some panning from the critics for his coloured postcard type of music, Richard's Melbourne concerts were a great success, and his singing of German Lieder highly praised. Diana again had the ladies breathless with her collection of furs, her backless evening gowns, and her gold kid gloves. She was the subject of many rumours, most of them harmless. People were sure that she was in Australia to star in a film, others certain that she was expecting a baby. 
Speaking to Stan Pretty in her London office recently, Diana recalls one incident. One thing did slightly um, amuse me. We were, get, we, uh, we were going, I think we were going by road somewhere, and we stopped at some little cafe house. And we found some little local paper, which had said that I was wearing the most wonderful Australia rabbit coat. Well, as it was a three and a half thousand pound <laughs> white ermine, I didn't think... <laughs> Richard left Melbourne on the spirit of progress, and Diana went off to a sheep station at Narracourt in South Australia to spend a few days with a couple called the Marshalls. Um, she'd met them on the voyage out. Richard was very pleased with the comforts of the spirit of progress, but was horrified to observe the drafty old carriages of the New South Wales railways, which awaited him on the other side of the platform at Albury. And so began the great Talbot train trauma. He said that the carriages would do service in the Trubics and nowhere else. He couldn't believe that anyone could have trains without heating in the middle of winter. They finally enticed him aboard with the promise of two hot water bottles and a blanket. After arriving in Canberra, he regretfully informed the ABC that he would travel no more by train. The issue turned into a minor political storm. In the New South Wales Parliament the next day, the Minister for Transport, Mr Brooksner, said rather defensively that it was not in the interest of the New South Wales Commissioner of Railways to attempt to compete with the luxury of train travel in Victoria. Wretched was how Sir Frederick Stewart, MHR, described the railway system between Albury and Canberra. He added in a rather beggars-can't-be-choosers attitude, but for the fact that I travel free, I would have exploded many times in the same manner. Mr Hartigan, the New South Wales Commissioner for Railways, closed the issue rather pompously a few weeks later at a dinner in Goulburn. He said, Mr Tauber is not visiting Australia as a philanthropist, but as a singer. I don't know what that proved. Surely do-gooders also suffer from the cold. Meanwhile, in the South Australian bush, Diana was having a marvellous time. I mean, this one particular sheep station I, I went to, they gave me some alcohol, not Marshall, but some other one, I can't remember. And it was terribly, terribly strong. Well, I just don't remember, you know, waking up. I don't remember uh, um, how I got back. I was driven back. All I knew was that in the morning, I had put artificial flowers in, my, in, in water the night before. Um, I was very much amused at that at the sheep station because, you see, the, there were all sorts of very funny sort of primitive things there, such as, um, you know, their toilet arrangements were kind of open, large one, middle one, small one, for old, middle-aged and young. <laughs> and, um, um, you know, I know you locked the door before you went in, but it was so funny to see all these other ones sitting there. How primitive Australia must have seemed to the Taubas. In Sydney, Richard was amazed that the town hall had no central heating. He demanded that the radiators be turned on at 4 p.m. on the days of his concerts. He was afraid that his voice would be seriously affected. Richard and Diana were reunited in Sydney, she having arrived earlier to supervise the moving of their 24 pieces of luggage into their suite in the Australia Hotel. The gala Sydney concert was held the next day at the town hall, and what a dress-up affair it was, with white fur capes and long gowns being the order of the day. Once again, Diana was the centre of attention. She was wearing a breathtaking Paris creation, which had been specially airmailed out for the occasion. It was of white organza, embossed with large silver and green roses. Hundreds of people crowded the foyer at interval, straining to get a glimpse of her. Some couldn't resist temptation. And when I got back to the hotel, it was pointed out to me by the porter, I think it was, that little bits had been cut off the back of the dress by s of souvenirs. It was a compliment, so I had to put up with it, you know. <laughs> the first time I've had bits taken off my behind, you know, <laughs> the souvenirs. Richard sang Schubert and Grieg in the first part of the program that opening night in Sydney. The second half was confined to excerpts from Franz Lehar operettas, which pleased the audience. Ich trete 
comes from the land of smiles. Richard was generous with his encores that night. On one occasion, he turned round and sang one encore to the audience behind him in the organ gallery.
that's from Johann Strauss's The Gypsy Baron. The Taubers spent a very hectic few weeks in Sydney. There were supper parties at Usher's Hotel, dinner at Leo Buring's Cellars in George Street, and both he and Diana drew the major prizes in New South Wales Lottery number 521. First prize was in the name of Mrs. Nell Kelly. Richard was best man at the wedding of his assistant artist, Vaughan Hanley, a talented young Australian violinist who was attracting very favourable reviews on the tour. Vaughan Hanley now lives in Perth. We caught up with him there and asked him about his memories of Richard Tauber and Diana Napier. They were very attached to one another. Uh, this was in 1938. They were like uh, honeymooners almost. And uh, she really had looked after him uh, and um, screened him from a lot of unnecessary um, troubles that go with touring. And... Um, I recall that he used to call her his little schnappola. And uh, there, after a while, I noticed that this word schnappola came up on sundry occasions. So one day I asked him what it meant, and I found out that it really meant nothing in particular. It's a sort of term of endearment. Uh, it can also mean thingamabob, or what you may call it. You know, it had no real name. Um, there's one interesting occasion when we were having a balance test at a hall, uh, and a lot of people who obviously weren't there on business, they'd managed to know somebody who knew somebody that could get them into the rehearsal. And I don't think Tauber appreciated this very much, but when he got up to sing, uh, they were prepared to listen to every utterance that he made and every note was a pearl to them. So it was a, a layer song that he sang first. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was probably Girls Were Made to Love and Kiss or something of this nature, which he sang so magnificently. And he was singing, Schnappala, oh, Schnappala, oh, Schnappala, and so on, um, making nonsense of it. And of course, he, it was so amusing, these people who, who Tava could do no wrong as far as they were concerned, they were all lapping it up. And then, of course, he said under his breath to his accompanist, that was cheap, now we will have some expensive stuff. <laughs> While the Taubers were in Australia, his former wife, Carlotta van Conti, sued him for alimony in Germany. Judgment was in favour of Richard. In 1930, during their separation, she'd asked for further alimony and had threatened to publish intimate details of his private life. It's more or less public knowledge that Richard was a great ladies' man. Diana Tauber, talking about their relationship during the war years, puts it this way. He was unfaithful. But as he said to me, and I do hope all you Australians will laugh at this and try and see it in the spirit in which I'm telling you, because we had the most wonderful relationship, but the war caused a lot of people to do a lot of things that they wouldn't have done normally. And he said to me, look, I want to tell you I have found a girlfriend, but it's not the love, it's only the bet. to love and kiss and to am I to interfere with this is it well who can tell but I know the good God may Tonight, and in a dolly beyond the heights, 
Tabas were treated almost like royalty in Australia, and all aspects of their private life were dished out to a hungry public. One Sydney newspaper reported that Richard's favourite dish was, not surprisingly, Wiener Schnitzel. Whether in the Adlon in Berlin, the Bristol in Vienna, or the Savoy in London, and the Aussie in Sydney, one presumes, he always ate it for his supper after a show. One reporter, stretching credibility a little also said that on his first nights, flowers crowd upon him from his admirers, and he spends hours after the final curtain taking the wires out of the carnations and roses, because, he says, they have been crucified. Spring has cast its bell on the smiling land Whispering a message which all may understand. Listen to its call in the dust of the flow. Where will it lead us? Only love me. Oh, that 
Also from the newspapers of the time, we learn that Mrs. Carver loves the friendliness of our country folk, particularly the servants and the working people. At one sumptuous luncheon, she stuck to her rather unusual diet of five potatoes and a glass of milk, nothing else. The New South Wales governor and his wife, Lord and Lady Wakehurst, attended one of the Sydney concerts. Richard sang some of the songs from his beloved Vienna. We lived within a world so fair to life so easy he had no care. We did not think of all the strife, our hearts were young and full of life. So long as we could drink our wine, so long as we found love divine. So long, so long as life was always fair, we found no happiness elsewhere. And that is why a world so bright, I dream of a lovely night in Vienna long ago. at his most sentimental when singing Viennese songs. Only a few months before his Australian tour, he'd fled the city because of the Nazi invasion of Austria. At one matinee concert in Sydney, the audience was visibly moved when he sang Vienna, City of My Dreams. Seems 
to be With rapture so sweet I walk through the town in the strand A lady so fair Beyond all compare Her filled me with joy and romance Her mood and her wife Her frown and her smile Keep changing so quickly each day No wonder I dream a beautiful dream and slaves me and I must obey. And though she has countless lovers like me, I have no wish to be. Like a queen with a light so gay You are the love of my heart today At another concert, where Tauber sang songs from Leha and Strauss, the Sydney Morning Herald music critic said he employs a soft falsetto for the highest notes, perhaps to excess, but the use of such devices as this in singing lighter music has won great popularity both for him and for the song. That's from the Leha operetta Frederica. Tauber received a good deal of rather snooty comment for his singing of popular ballads, some of the more common remarks being musical flotsam and sentimental and superficial. Perhaps his style was best summed up by the Sydney Sun, whose critic said, whatever his qualities as a musician, Tauber is a great singer. He may have a liking for sugary and trifling songs, or he may sing them because he likes to sing to a public which likes them. This does not detract one whit from the charm of his superb voice, the perfection of his production, or the instinctive sense of beauty behind his interpretation. Diana Tauber sums him up this way. He walked onto the platform, and in two seconds he was smiling at them, waving to them, and he got them. His personality got them before he opened his mouth. He was very childish in many ways. He had a very childish nature. He was very naive and utterly unconceited. He'd come off sometimes with enormous applause. And he did that in Melbourne. He said, they do like me, don't they? He never, another thing is that during the war, he never refused. A lot of these emigrant Jews, he was half a Jew, uh, used to come to him at the Dorset Hotel where we had it. And they never went away him to hand him. It was only a fiver, you know. So, very generous man. Very generous man. Too generous. <laughs> Too generous. No businessman. For example, he, he, he was so frightened of being caught up in, in losses over gramophone companies or so on that he, for example, he, he was not on royalties and, uh, except up to 1939. So he sold the most famous one, You're My Heart's Delight, for 80 pounds. <laughs> Oh, 
sang in Australia, Richard Tarber received warm receptions. At the end of each concert, the audience clamoured for encores. Tarber always obliged with many, and invariably included Goodbye from the White Horse Inn. Und eines Tages sind mit Anklang, da zog ein Fähnrich zur Garde, ein Fähnrich jung und voll Leichtsinn und schlank, auf der Karte die goldene Kokarde. Da stand die Mutter vor ihrem Sohn, die seine Hände umflungen, schenkt ihm ein kleines Medaillon. Sie sagt zu ihrem Jungen, Adieu, mein kleiner Gardeoffizier, Adieu, Adieu, und vergiss mich nicht, und vergiss mich nicht. Adieu, mein kleiner Gardeoffizier, Adieu, Adieu, sei das Glück mit dir, sei das Glück mit dir. Die gerade Kerzen gerade lassen in den Sonnenpass, was immer geschehen und mag. Hast du Sorgen, Minen, Ort mit ihnen, Ort mit ja, ja, viel Triebsal sind andere da. Adieu, mein kleiner Gardeoffizier, adieu, adieu, und vergiss mich nicht, und vergiss mich nicht. Gerade ich hab's denn gerade lache in den Sonnentag, was immer geschehen auch mag. Hast du Sorgen, Minen, fort mit ihnen, fort damit, ja, ja, für Trübsal sind andere da. Adieu, mein kleiner Gardeoffizier, adieu, adieu, und vergiss mich nicht, und vergiss mich nicht. Adieu, adieu, mein kleiner Gardeoffizier. Adieu, adieu, mein kleiner Gardeoffizier. Adieu. 
Let's meet somebody now who knew Tauber as a friend and as a working colleague, the Australian-born soprano Nancy Brown. They starred together in his wartime musical production, Old Chelsea. Nancy, nice to have you on the program. Thank you, John. It's lovely to be here to talk to you. Tell me something about Old Chelsea, because I've, I've heard the music from it, but I've never seen the show. Uh, it was a charming period piece uh, set in Old Chelsea around 1700, and um, uh, Tauber played the part of Joseph, who was a composer, struggling to get his music on, and uh, there he had the friend of a little milliner who was played in the show by Carol Lynn, who is now Lady Delphont, as you know, and he was looking for somebody like me to play the prima donna, a prima donna called Nancy Gibbs. And the story is how the prima donna furthers his career and uh, he falls for her, of course, and breaks the heart of the little milliner, but it all comes right in the end. You and I don't mean the same when speaking of our heart's desire. I just want the little flame while your aim is a Richard Tauber and Nancy Brown, the song from Old Chelsea. Nancy, let's talk a little bit, some personal reminiscences of land. I remember once we were singing in the provinces and a direction had always gone forward that afternoon tea, which was then served in the theatre, was never to be served until after the first act and the curtain had come down because at the end of the first act, Tauber always sang his wonderful Tauber lead. Well, this day, one of the um, ushers carried a tea tray down to the front of the stalls while he was in the middle of it. And Tauber's face became like thunder. And he looked at this poor girl and he stopped his song. He motioned to Krish to stop the orchestra. And he said to the girl, take that back. Take that back. You know I have instructions to have no tea served till the curtain's down. So the poor girl scuttled up the aisle, all the ladies' matinee hats bobbing around with <laughs> consternation. And to my amazement, I was with him on the stage at the time, he continued his song where he broke it on a pianissimo top A without a waver. And he finished, and of course the curtain came down, to dead silence. He'd completely stunned the audience with this. And of course, after the minute had passed, we all giggled and said that that's one of Tauber's better performances. <laughs> Great stars are not always amiable people. Um, did you like him as a man? Yes, he was a wonderful man. He was very childlike, really. Um, he he was kind, he was generous. I find great stars usually are. And I remember when people heard at first that I was going to sing as his prima donna, they said, oh, you poor dear, he's so temperamental. He f has temperaments here, there, and everywhere. But of course, I found it completely different. He 
always brought me forward when he was able and he always helped and if there was any advice to be given which incidentally I feel made me sing better then in my career than I've ever sung before or since. A personal reminiscence of Tava by the Australian soprano Nancy Brown. Richard Tava's tour of Australia ended in September 1938 and he left the country full of determination to return. Well, the war intervened, but a contract had been signed for a second tour for the ABC when he died of lung cancer in January 1948. We'll end this hour of Richard Tauber memories by playing a very rare recording of his last public performance. It was made at Covent Garden on the 27th of September 1947. He'd been asked to sing the role of Don Ottavio on the final night of the Vienna State Opera production of Don Giovanni. Despite the fact that one of his lungs had been destroyed, he gave one of the finest performances of his career. Sharp wrote that music feature on the life of Richard Tauber. Special guests were Diana Napier and Nancy Brown. <laughs>